Bahrain, Qatar, United Arab Emirates, and Oman. The university has two colleges, the College of Graduate Studies with 11 programs of master and PhD, and the College of Medicine and Medical Sciences with uh, an MD program and seven graduate studies programs also in master's and PhD. And the French Arabian Business School, which offers uh, an MBA. The College of Medicine MD program is the leading problem-based community-oriented program in the Arabian Gulf. The university has received institutional accreditation from the Saudi National Commission for Academic Accreditation and Assessment and is among the top 500 universities worldwide according to QS rankings. The college launched its online teaching on March 22nd and has managed since to complete the curriculum of all years and has successfully conducted examinations for most years. I welcome you again and hope you will benefit from our experiences in online assessment. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Khalid, for your words. And now we will start with Mr. Stephen uh, with his session that will be on online written assessment. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Sarah, for this. Let me just try and share my screen and my presentation right now with you. Um, uh, you were able to see it, right, everybody? Yes, it's clear. Yes, Stephen. Okay, um, so before we just go ahead and share our experience at AGU for our online uh, written examination or assessment, um, I would like to uh, first introduce myself. My name is Arpan Stephen. I'm the e-learning specialist at College of Medicine and Medical Sciences. Uh, I basically overlook um, all the online learning initiatives related to e-learning uh, in teaching and assessments and so on. Uh, my PowerPoint slide will not be too long. Uh, since we uh, started about five minutes late, so I'll just try and uh, cope up with time as uh, as and when it goes. So if you have any queries, I would request you to, there's a time assigned basically at the end of the each session that you can post your queries. And I think if you see in your chats, you will see that uh, you can actually post your queries in chat and we'll be happy to assist and answer those after we're done with this, okay? So you just park your questions uh, and then we can go ahead with this. So what, what are the objectives? The objectives for this session would basically be four. And that is first, why do we need online assessments? Okay, I'll just spend two minutes uh, on this as well. And what are basic challenges in online examination or online assessments? And the third will come where we'll spend most of our time that would be AGU's experience with online written exam. Uh, and then what are the success factors and the lessons that are learned throughout, okay? So uh, I will only be talking about the written examination, online written examination. We have sessions which will also talk about online OSCEs, which uh, uh, our colleagues will be sharing in the next sessions. Okay, uh, so first, why the online assessments? Now, we all know that this is time of the need, but I would also like to call it an opportunity. So if we talk about the need first, this COVID-19 situation came to up as a bomb and nobody uh, uh, you know, was prepared for it. So it was the apt need at that point in time that we had to go ahead with not just online learning, but also online examinations. Um, and practically, if you ask me, that was the only way of assessment at this time of the hour, when nobody's visiting campus. Uh, especially as Dr. Tabara mentioned that AGU it was formed by GCC. So most of our students come from all the GCC uh, countries. So all of them are scattered in their hometowns and we wanted to get the exam to them. And of course, you know, uh, continuous assessment is actually a very integral part of 
the entire teaching and learning process. But when we talk about examination and or assessments, it's also an opportunity because it actually presents us with, you know, exciting possibilities of individual learning paradigms. You get on spot reports, you get analytics, you get on spot feedback with online assessment. And mm -hmm. something that we'll be talking in our sessions later on will be AI or artificial uh, intelligence enabled authentication and proctoring, which is one of the very important criteria in online examination. So what are the basic challenges that we as all face in online assessments? Okay. Now, most of you are completely aware of this, but we just want to point it out from our perspective when we went on uh, thinking about this. So if you see, you know, cheating is very easy to do in online exam and it is very difficult to detect because you're not physically present in front of the students and all the exams, you know, are open book exams, right? There's no way to restrict them from not accessing anything else from a different device or in the same device from different apps. There's no moderator for this exam for examinations which are online. So nobody's there to invigilate them at that point in time. And then of course, uh, online examination requires certain kind of technological advances uh, and resources, which are not same or similar for a lot of uh, people. So some of, some of the students will be using a particular kind of device. They might have internet connectivity issues uh, and they will have different kinds of hardware and diff technical difficulties, which, 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 which we foresee. And then for, and the thing is communication with students. Now this is a very integral part, which we learn. It's not just making the application available for students, but communicating with them on how to use it effectively and efficiently without any issues. So this basically will sum up all the challenges. Of course, there are million challenges that we have, but these are broad challenges that we uh, found out when we were researching on different platforms on how we wanted to go about with online assessment. So what do we, what, what we needed, what did we need basically? We needed a full fledged user friendly assessment application, something that does everything for us. Okay. We wanted a secure exam. Now this is, we, there are a lot of multiple application or assessment tools available in the market at this stage. But we wanted something which will secure an exam examination to maintain examination integrity. Uh, and so basically we needed uh, the platform to do just that for us. We also needed the platform to give us perfect and accurate reports and analytics on exams. Okay. And student feedbacks. And the most important part was that we wanted an online, but an offline attempt to the exams. Now, what I mean by, uh, by like, we, we have multiple, you know, we have, uh, we have many LMSs that we use for our different uh, uh, pedagogical uh, activities. But the thing is, since right now, when we know that because of the situation, everybody is online, basically, the whole globe is online. There's always this phase where the connect connectivity can play, can be a setback to examinations online specifically. So our central LMS is Moodle. We also have an LMS called as Unio, both of which have capabilities to take an exam, but we wanted to take an exam that is online, but has offline access. That means you could do your exams without the need of internet. Okay. So this is how we plan and implemented uh, the online examination at AGU. Uh, and this will show you basically the timeline. It started with April 2020, as you know, in March, we started with uh, our online uh, learning uh, on our LMSs. Uh, we soon found a need that we wanted to take an exam and we started search researching a lot of platforms that we could have used. So in April, starting of April, we actually started identifying different kinds of platforms that were available. We tried Moodle, we tried uh, proctoring solutions over Moodle. Uh, we, we tried many things. But then we, we went down and identified Examplify as the go-to app for us by ExamSoft. Part of the reasons they're an old player in the market, they've been there in tw for 23 years in, in this business. Uh, and once you, I will actually go ahead and show you the different kinds of features that it offers uh, to cater to all of our assessment needs. You will agree to that as well. Uh, and this is basically the platform that is used for US bar exams as well. So during April, we started planning and then April itself, we procured Examplify. 
uh, for the College of Medicine. This was one of the success reasons for, uh, for us as well in, in ensuring that we were able to conduct exams successfully. We acted really fast. And then there was a training that was, so there was, there was a core team that was identified that included the dean, that included people from the IT, that included people from e-learning, that included people from the assessment office, including the director of uh, assessment. That core team was trained at multiple occasions on using this platform and creating exams, giving the exams, you know, reporting structure, proctoring and so on. And that happened through May. And then during the same time, the assessment office, along with the director of assessment, was involved in creating different kinds of exams. So if you take the number, we almost created about 37 exams, all night exams for our students from foundation year to year six, uh, including our MD exams. And then throughout May, we gave lots and lots of mock exams for students of each year. So the mock exams range between anywhere between four to six mock exams per year per student that was given to them just to ensure that everybody is on the same platform. And during the exam, there's nothing that goes wrong. And I'm happy to share that not even a single student faced any technical difficulties whose exam was canceled or postponed because of, uh, because of so many mocks and training sessions that we had. And then finally, May through June, we had our exams, so we, we actually practically took all exams from foundation year one, year two, year three, year four, year, and then year six. Uh, and we're still continuing with our exams that will continue to July 28th, but most of the exams have already been taken. Okay, so coming back to the platform itself, uh, we wanted something that is basically a very user-friendly, that has a very user-friendly approach, okay? Uh, and something which is device agnostic which means that device and browser agnostic, that students who, who who's using um, a, a, a Windows laptop or a Mac laptop or different devices, it has to be device agnostic. So this platform was completely device agnostic, except the exception, which is an iPad, which I'll come to that, but only one feature, which I will share later on in one of the challenges that we face. Uh, this platform offers multiple question types that caters to our need, which is MCQs, short answer question, essay type, master following, fill in blanks, close question, close embedded questions, so questions within a question. And then multiple types of questions that cater to our needs. So you can have a picture, you can have a video uh, as part of the question embedded in the question. It also provided some really good assessment assistant tools like calculator in case there's a biostatistic exam that you want to calculate something on. You can have the calculator, you have text highlighter. There's a timer that click ticks on top and then there's a five minute alarm that you can set for each exam. And of course, it also offers you missing answer reminder. So overall, it did everything that we needed for the exam. Now, this is basically how the exam dashboard looks like. Now, for some of you, you might, you know, it might not be clear, but I will explain you what, what it does. This is our admin view of an exam, of a particular exam. So it, this is actually of a real exam that you see I've hidden just for confidentiality purposes, I've hidden the real exam, but this is a real screen, which displays the exam title. If you can see out here, it gives you the download video. It shows you the download video the download window basically which means that as a, as a, as a, as an admin i can define the time that a student can download so for example if my exam is tomorrow i can decide a time today 5 p.m for a student to be able to download so i can decide decide the time for download i can decide the time for the exam attempt i also decide the time for exam upload okay so if you see out here it shows that there were 188 ex students that were given this exam, out of which 187 downloaded the exam, and then 187 uploaded their exam. Now you're saying what is download and upload. For an offline exam, the only way it would work is that you download an exam, take it offline, and then upload it automatically. The system is automated, by the way, and I'll just run you through when we go ahead with this thing. But coming to the most important part, security, securing the exam for integrity. That's why I've written preventing and deterring academic dishonesty. Now, 
everybody was forced into this situation of taking online exam. Many people uh, tried multiple platforms. The thing is how to make an exam secure to avoid any cheating attempt. First, we wanted a system that actually locks the entire device in and out, disables the Wi-Fi. So you don't have any access. The moment you start an exam, everything, it's just your exam in front of your whole window. You cannot close it. You cannot control Alt or Delete, Alt F4, nothing works. The Wi-Fi is disconnected. You don't have any access. Even in cases where you have duplicate um, monitors or display units, it will cancel that out as well. So let's say you know you have a duplicate monitor that runs something else and a monitor here. It just cancels out everything. It will block any access except the exam itself. Now there are two levels of authentication, what we had. The first one is called the exam ID. Now this is an AI enabled two level authentication process. The first process is that you have a unique username and password for every single student. Now this is first, to ensure that that particular student is entering the exam. And the second one, which requires AI, is facial recognition. Just as we have recognition of, in our phones, the system will actually capture a picture, match it with your baseline image to ensure that a student is that particular student who's actually taking the exam and no one else. It will also see if there's anyone else in that picture. The second one is a more comprehensive and the more secure option for exam integrity and that is called the exam monitor. Now I know some of you might have experience with exam, exam softs, Examplify. So this thing might not be new, but for all the people who are not aware, I just wanted to share our experience on this. So exam monitor is basically proctoring solution, okay? Wherein it will record the entire session of your exam. Not only will it, will it record the system automatically with the help of AI built-in, will be able to find incidents of any cheating attempt in, 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 during the exam. And then this is the first step. First it's AI proctoring and then it is also the human proctoring where there will be a human proctor who will assess the whole video and see based on the feedback provided by the system. And I will be sharing uh, with you a, a, a sample of how that looks like in our coming slides from a mock exam uh, that we have. Now you have other security features uh, which you're aware of that is basically a randomized question sequence and answer choices. The exam is time is restricted. There's a specific download time. There's a specific upload time. There's a specific start time. There's a specific attempt. And then of course you have the exam password. So even if you have the exam downloaded, you cannot attempt it unless you have a password, which we usually give three to five minutes before the exam. And then there's something very interesting called as a resume code. Now, if there's anyone who tries and plays smart and switch off or power off the device or do anything and wants to get back on, the system is built in. The moment you switch on your laptop, within seven seconds, it will automatically fill up your screen. You don't have to open this app again. It will automatically fill up your screen. By somehow still any way they are trying, if any student tries and manually power shut down, then there's something, if you, if you miss that gap of seven minutes, then it will ask you for a resume code, which will be given only by the administration, administrator. So basically, let's assume I'm a student who switches off my computer, I get back on end within seven minutes. If the seven minute window is over, then to start and attempt an exam, I cannot start the exam and, or attend the, or continue my attempt unless I have a resume code for which I will need to contact the administrator and the system will tell what happened to the, during the exam. And then based on the feedback, we will decide whether to give the resume code or cancel the exam for that student. Okay, now this is what I was calling as exam ID, what I was talking about, the first part. So if you see out here in this, this is basically, I hope you can see my mouse, right? Okay, can you see my mouse? Yes, Steven, yes. So, yes okay, yes. so this is basically the baseline image which is cap captured the first time this exam exemplify is used. And then when this assessment starts, it tells you exactly what time the assessment, the student logged in, and it also takes a picture for you to verify it. So the system will verify it for you. If this doesn't match, then it will say image verification failed. And it will jump onto a resume code for that student, 
which in, in, in turn, will uh, the student will ask us for a resume code and we'll check in the system why it failed to ensure that uh, th these are the same people who are doing. And it's not just normal facial recognition, it is actually a proper facial recognition that happens using AI. Okay, coming to the interesting part, I don't know whether this will be clear based on the internet connectivity, but I'll still explain this to you. This is the exam monitor. As I said, it is an AI enabled. So you see, this is basically a full video of two hours and 20 minutes of an exam. This is the student. It includes the video and the audio of the system. Okay, and if you see out here, this says there's no integrity breach, but if there is integrity breach, then it will come up this out as red. And then if you go down here, I will read these out because I'm sure this might not be clear, uh, but I'll read these out. It will identify if there was any unnatural hand gesture, if it will notify you as an incident, if there was any off screen gaze, if a student moved, whether the student was speaking, whether there was any suspicious object like a second laptop or a phone, whether there were more than one person in the room, and then there were whether the test taker was missing. Now this test taker is dif disabled by RN, but if you see the time here, this is a timeline of the entire exam. You can scroll by any timeline to see what that student did during the exam. But since we had a good student, there was no technical integrity breach. The system will tell it. Of course, if the system fails to tell it, then you also have a human proctoring that completes the whole step, okay? Now, coming back to reporting and analytics, uh, and this is one of our last few slides from my presentation. It is basically, it will go ahead and tell you the entire course performance in a chart and by data, and then it will tell you the class performance. It will tell you student performance, individual student per performance. It will give you a lot of statistical analysis, and then it will also share you the incident reports. And based on that, it will, the whole thing works. So if I show you the class summary of a course, uh, it will show you the mean score, it will show you the median score, the highest score, the lowest score, okay? And then if I show you the assessment summary report, this is basically a graph, okay? So it will tell you what the average score was, what was the lowest score, what was the high score, and then it will show you the graph. And basically, it doesn't show here, but when I click on any one of these, it will show me the number of students that were in this category. Okay, now again, this is it, 40 to 49 doesn't show that these are failing this. There are many more components to assessment. This is just one of them, but you can see the, the highest range is between the 60 and 69. And if I click on it, it will actually show me the exact number of students that were in this, in this category criteria. Now, what were the success factors and what were the lessons learned for us, okay? Uh, the success factors was that, they, you know, we, we quickly responded to the COVID-19 crisis. We didn't wait too long. We identified the app solution immediately and procured it as soon as we can. Uh, biggest success was for the ages and College of Medicine's uh, management for quick approval or procurement and for drafting out a clear action plan uh, for this. Uh, I would like to owe this also to uh, the exam core team that had the Dean, Vice Deans, the assessment office staff, IT and e-learning unit, um, who were there to support. And I'll tell you the real practice, for every single exam, this core team will sit in one room together, will have big displays on the screen, and I'll show you in the pictures uh, coming, and would support instantaneously if any student at any given point in time during the exam faced any issue, that student was supported at that very moment. We gave a lot of mock exams, as I said, anywhere between five and uh, four and six exams per student per year, uh, and students became really familiar with the platform, and that's why till now, we didn't have even a single student miss the exam because of any technical issues or software issues. There were many instructional videos and training materials that students uh, were given, and also for our exam administrators. Now, what were the lessons learned? Uh, one of the challenges that we had was that the exam monitor features does not work on the iPad. Uh, you can take an exam on an iPad, exam ID will work, but exam monitor, which is video recording of the session, doesn't work on the iPad. We could solve it, we initially had issues, but we could solve it by just advising the students to use laptops, either buy them or borrow them uh, from their friends for the exam. And, uh, uh, take the exam and so far it's been successful. 
Uh, of course, there's a learning curve to this platform and not everybody is, uh, they, the technical capabilities differ uh, uh, with different people. So there are some students who actually needed more training. So for some students, they were, you know, they were quick enough to get the exam working and taking the exam within one attempt. But for some, it took four or five or six attempts at max. But we keep kept giving them ex mock exams just to ensure that they are right on track and, and that we were able to support. We had a dedicated team of people, uh, of support staff, who would be available for them uh, 20 hours each day, even after office hours, to ensure that their queries were resolved at time. Uh, just a quick glimpse of exam uh, core team. Uh, there are many other people in this, but we could have, we, uh, we, 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 uh, we, I, I had only one space to put it through. Uh, but as you can see, we had hosted everything on a big screen and we had a support uh, group that was uh, there all, all, all and off to support every single uh, student at a given point in time. Uh, and thank you so much for my presentation. I'll be happy if you have any questions. Uh, if you have any questions, please. Okay, so thank you, Mr. Stephen, for, for your valued input and well-structured stru presentation. Uh, now we will have five minutes for questions and discussion. So uh, we had a question uh, from, where, um, they were asking about how we could uh, check the ID offline, if you can, please. Check the ID of the student offline? Yes. Yeah, see, you need internet to start the exam and to end the exam. But once you start the exam, so exam ID basically needs an internet connection. So a student is supposed to be online while taking an exam. What happens is when a student logs in and start an exam, he has to enter an exam password, which will be authenticated online. The moment exam password works, the first thing will be popped up will be his camera and photograph and automatic authentication. The moment it authenticates, it gives a message that now Examplify is going to close all apps and start it. That's where every app and behind every, every program, including the Wi-Fi that gets disconnected and Examplify becomes full screen and it becomes offline. So you take the exam. So exam is basically downloaded and then uploaded. Exam, exam ID uh, identification happens while the internet is on just before it gets disconnected before starting the exam. Okay, uh, so we had also another question which is, uh, which was culture specific. Uh, they were asking about uh, regarding female students who has a face cover, uh, niqab. Okay. Yeah, this, so, was, this was this especially was for the face recognition. Yes, this was a really, real big challenge. And honestly, we, we had issues initially with this as well. Uh, we didn't have so many of these issues because particularly we gave instruction that you need a full face uh, uh, open to be able to authenticate at this stage. Uh, but uh, glad, good news is that, you know, the facial recognition can also work if it, you have at least your eyes open. So if anyone has their eyes open till here and here, you were able to authenticate and it authenticated. We have some students like that for, uh, for, uh, uh, with this and they were able to take an exam. Okay. Uh, yeah. Also one more question. That's a very valid question, by the way. Yes. Yeah. Uh, also we had uh, someone asking about uh, whether there was, a, a, whether did we use any system that integrates with Moodle? Oh yeah, very good question. See, Moodle is our central LMS and Examplify does integrate uh, with, uh, with Moodle completely. There are two things required. One is a single sign-on that is required to integrate Moodle, uh, Examplify to Moodle. And it is useful in a state when, when Moodle as an LMS is basically measuring your learning outcomes. If you have course competence is defined. So we did use Moodle as our LMS for our online learning, which had a big blue button integrated over on the top of it. But for our Examplify at this stage, because we didn't have time, we didn't integrate it with Moodle at all. But yes, it is a complete possibility. ExamSoft does uh, support in uh, uh, integrating it with Moodle. And then you can export the grades from Examplify directly into Moodle. And then there will be a you know student performance report that you can actually extract out of Moodle uh, to be able to do that. But that is our intended plan for, uh, for the next academic year in case uh, we still have this situation going forward, then we would like to integrate Examplify uh, with uh, Moodle. 
That's a very good question. Yes, and one last question here is about uh, that if the exam could be downloaded, uh, can it be copied by the students? Uh, no, uh, this, this was tried a lot of times, but it doesn't. So you can, you can download Examplify as a software in any number of devices, but you can only download the exam once. So if I have a laptop and then if I have an iPad, if I download my exam on my laptop, I won't be able to download my exam on my iPad. It cannot be copied. It's only a one-time download and one attempt only. Unless I delete the exam from here and then download it, that's a different thing. That also only we as admins can do. But exam once downloaded can only be used in one device. Okay, so here uh, we just said that that was the last question, but we have another very important please question. Please yes, please. It is about, uh, they're asking how do you make the psychometric analysis of the exam questions? Uh, the system does it for us. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have that screen, but I will be happy to share it with you. Uh, the system does it for us. And of course, uh, any data related to the question basically uh, can be exported in the form of an XLS and it can be computed locally by the assessment office. So the assessment office actually involves into, uh, is involved into this. I'm not sure if uh, Dr. Fouad is there, otherwise he would have been able to answer this question much better. But the system does all the analysis and of course the assessment office computes everything. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you again, Mr. Steven. And here we would like to say again that all your questions will be taken into consideration. We will uh, surely get back to you after the webinar and answer you all. Okay, so now we will move to Dr. Archana. Uh, you're with us, Dr. Archana. Yes. Sir. Yes, please. Yes, Sarah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we will uh, Stephen, move. can you stop sharing your screen? Uh, I, I've already stopped sharing. Okay, so now we have Dr. Archana, whose uh, session will be about organization of online OSCE. The floor is yours. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, are you able to see my screen, Sarah? Uh, no, we, we can see you. Not yet. Okay, one minute. Okay, now we can see it, Dr. Archana. Yeah. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you very much. Welcome to the second session of uh, today's webinar. We'll be talking about organization of online OSCE. This presentation has uh, two objectives. First, I'll be describing the steps in organizing an online OSCE, and then I'll be highlighting few areas of potential challenges and feasible solutions from our experience. Let's get started. What do we have to do first? We have to get everyone on board. Why is this important? Because this is a huge transition process and we need to have consensus of all stakeholders. At this point of time, we have to be really transparent and genuinely spell out the expectations and limitations of online exams. The best way to do this is to hold a series of meetings with various levels, with the higher leadership, with the faculty, with the administrators, with the technical team, with secretaries and so on. And more importantly, whatever we discuss, it has to be minuted for future reference. Once you get the green signal from the leadership, we may have to think about our infrastructure. What is our weakness and what is the strength? Appropriate selection of the venue is very vital for the e effective execution of virtual exams. All assessment rooms placed in same corridor, at least same floor will facilitate logistics and communication. 
Having said that, so many rooms may not belong to the same department. So once you identify the rooms, official emails should be sent to the HODs to request them to relieve those rooms on specific days and what is the duration of uh, uh, time which you require to use those rooms. Once the venue is ready, you may have to make a list of things which we need for the exam. The second important thing is uh, high speed stable internet connectivity, preferably the Sorry, preferably the landline, a uh, Wi-Fi may have its own uh, issues. So we ensured that all the systems had a specific landline connection. And we need to have a big screen for better monitoring, electric bell, stopwatch, rooms, computers, cameras, speakers, extension boxes, everything you just have to make a list of them and procure them well in advance before you proceed with other steps. Okay, now we have the infrastructure, what next? This is very important. We have to select your task force. What do we mean by the task force? There are three important elements for the task force, the faculty, the secretarial staff, and the technical team. I would call them three pillars of the task force. Again, these uh, uh, people are from different departments with the various roles and responsibilities. Once we identify them, we may have to send an official email to their HODs to permit them to participate in this activity and also to relieve them from other commitments. Okay, we have the task force now. Are they ready to do what is expected to deliver? May or may not be. So we may have to train them and support them in whatever way possible. So how did we increase the capacity building of our task force? We conducted a series of workshops way ahead of uh, the actual implement of the exams. They were conducted in the month of May. We conducted specifically for the potential assessors of uh, the online OSCE exams. During this workshop, they were given hands-on training about what is Zoom and what are the different breakout rooms, how to enter, how to exit. Everything was given to them. And similar workshops were conducted for secretaries and technical team as well. With this capacity building, do you think we are ready for uh, doing the online OSCE? Actually, after the capacity building, interestingly, you will find that they will have a lot of questions because they have moved from the stage of unconscious incompetence to conscious incompetence. That means they know what to do, but uh, they, know, they do not know how to do it and how to simplify the process. This is where we need to have procedures and guidelines in place. Before going into the specific details, we have to tell them the holistic process first. What is going to happen from beginning to end and what are the different things that are being done in an online exam. This whole picture is very important for everyone to know because they need to know where they fit in exactly. And once they realize their importance, the error became very less. Once you give the holistic picture, now we have to go into the specifics. We developed guidelines which were black and white with the no gray zones. We developed general instructions for the students and also specific technical instruction for the students and uh, the role of examiner, exam host, co-host, the invigilator, the technical support and secretaries. So these guidelines were developed and this simplified the process. And after the guidelines, most of the technical team and the other people of the task force felt very confident of going forward. Are we ready yet? No, we need to conduct a number of mock exams because mock exams will allow you to make mistakes and you learn from your mistakes and you rectify them. And after the mock, probably you will reach a place where you can achieve reasonable amount of perfection in your exam process. So I'm going to tell you what is that we learned from our mock. First and foremost, it helped us refining our planning. This was our planning before the mock exams. See, we had only the list of examiners and a bunch of uh, numbers of different rooms. We thought it would be enough to, to run the exam, but actually we landed up you know, with a refined list of various uh, people who played a uh, small role to bigger role. And this was the comprehensive list we started using after the mock and this reduced a lot of ambiguity and brought in clarity to the entire process. Next, it improvised our guidelines. Look at our guidelines. It underwent a lot of revision, deletion, modification, etc. And we took feedback from all the members of the task force. And at the end of the mark, we had 
very clear, specific uh, guidelines with simple English, which everybody could follow. And it streamlined the student allotment. Before the mock exam, we allowed, we gave the Zoom link to all the students and they all logged in at the same time, which led to a lot of confusion for the host and the co-host. But end of the mock, we decided that they will be divided into small batches, maybe 10 or 12 maximum, and they were given specific time and the Zoom link was shared with this cohort only in the specific time. And it also helped us identify the bottleneck areas. In one of the mock exam, we were running almost one and a half hours late. When we reflected upon the entire process, we identified that the verification of the students took a lot of time. So what we decided, we split this one pretest room into two rooms and the students were allotted to two different secretaries and the checking became very easy and we were able to save a lot of time. And mocks also recognized troubleshooters. During the mock, we identified a set of students who had issues with the logging in or with a very poor connection. And after the mock, each one of them were called individually and the technical team supported them very well. And all the students were able to participate in the real exam without much of difficulty. And the mocks also helped us in the time management. If you look at this picture, here we requested the examiners to log in at around 10 a.m., almost one hour ahead of the student login because we needed so much time to ensure everything was working well. But as we had number of marks, if you look at this picture, almost same time both of them logged in. By the time the students completed the verification, the examiners also completed other procedures and they were ready for the exam. And you can also see students were given different time slot to enter. And coming to verification for the NICAP students, we had a separate breakout room where they were allowed separately. The ID were checked by a female secretary and then they were allowed to enter the exam. During the exam, they were allowed to wear the niqab. And the most importantly, the marks help us to look at the bigger picture. When we, run, uh, when we ran series of marks, we realized that most of the departments had similar issues and uh, we were able to help each other. And at the end of the day, all the departments were ready with the, uh, whatever required for the online exams and they were able to meet the objectives within the time frame. Throughout these uh, six steps, you know, what we kept uh, very clear, the communication. Communication is the key. Did we tell everything to everybody or did we maintain a focused communication? We thought the focused communication would help. We started with the planning team, which had uh, administrators and the senior staff and with core committee members. And whatever decisions uh, which were taken in the planning team was later uh, um, disseminated to technical force and also to the secretaries. The assessors of each department had their own uh, WhatsApp groups and whatever was required to be uh, disseminated here, it was disseminated here. And my favorite is the student group. We had a bigger group and the smaller group for students. The bigger group was utilized to deliver general instructions. But for online OSCE, what helped us was the smaller groups. With the, As I told you, each cohort had 10 or 12 students. And we developed WhatsApp groups for each one of those cohorts. And they were named like this, the name of the department, the a series of the cohort, and the time at which the Zoom link has to be um, shared with them. So these are the smaller WhatsApp groups, which really helped us in the smooth conducting of the exam. And of course, you have to standardize your Zoom settings before the exam. So I'm not going into the details of Zoom settings now, my friend will talk about it in the subsequent session. But I just want to tell you that you have to standardize everything, the general setting, the video, audio, chat, share screen, and uh, what is that you're going to do for uh, participants entering the breakout rooms. All these uh, settings have to be made very clear and the same setting should be followed for all the exams in order to maintain standardization. And of course, any um, curricular innovation, we need to take feedback from all the stakeholders, more importantly, the students and faculty. So before you start your exams, please develop your own feedback forms and keep them ready. And we also recommend a mix of uh, qualitative and quantitative feedback. And how did we receive the qualitative feedback? During our exam, we allotted one breakout room exclusively for uh, feedback from the students at the end of the exam. 
and the students were interviewed based on semi-structured interview guide and which helped us to get the qualitative feedback from them. And of course, we have to think of uh, safety during this uh, COVID-19 era and uh, we have to know the limitations of new normal and we followed all the measures which were, uh, um, which were advised as uh, social distancing, mask and hand sanitizer, etc. These were the 10 steps of organizing an online OSCE. So is it going to be uh, so uneventful? No, definitely you're going to have uh, potential challenges and we are happy to share whatever feasible solutions we found from our experience and we believe this will help you too. Coming to the first challenge, possibility of posting round questions being shared with the students because we use the same computers for multiple exams again and again. So how did we uh, overcome this? We ensured that the secretary assigned to delete the questions at the end of each exam. So at any given point of time, all the systems had only one question which was supposed to be posted for that particular cohort. Second, how do we ensure quality assurance? All the examiners were instruct to instructed to record the exams and they were all saved. And it was saved in the format like date, the panel number and the department name. In addition to that, we also had the invigilator visiting each one of those rooms virtually. And most of the times we encourage the head of the departments to join the invigilator to visit all the rooms virtually to ensure that the exam was conducted as per the protocol. All these recordings were handed over to the assessment unit for future reference. And this might happen and which uh, may disrupt the entire uh, planning. Unexpected absenteeism of the task force. We had a well-planned backup support, as you can see from here. We had backup for faculty invigilators, the technical support, and also the invigilator support for each and every day. And of course, we sent emails to all these people to make sure that they were available. They were available uh, uh, on these days. And uh, you can also have unexpected uh, technical failure like uh, speaker might go out or the cameras may not work suddenly. So you should uh, keep this in mind and this will definitely help you if you have a backup of all these things. Error in naming the Zoom display. As a host, when you look at the screen, you will see only the uh, display of the Zoom uh, screens in your screen. Whatever coordination you're going to do, it's mainly based on the display which you see on the screen. So if it is not named properly, it's going to lead to a lot of confusion. So how did we overcome this? We ensured that we uh, stuck the correct panel number and name of the examiner outside uh, each of those rooms. And we also instructed our technical team to rename the Zoom accordingly every day. This was checked every day before starting the exam to ensure that the panels were named correctly based on the panel number, the station number, and the examiner name. Sometimes students might leave Zoom before the next cohort is admitted. Why are we particular about this? Because we had same questions for two cohort of students and we didn't want any contamination between cohort one and cohort two. So we ensured that the students of cohort two are admitted before the cohort one leaves the Zoom. So what did we do? We explained this process very well to the student. We told them every exam has three components, the pre-test that is identification, the actual test, the OSCE stations, and the post-test that is the feedback station. And leaving the Zoom during any of these steps would be considered violation or cheating. Once this was communicated, all the students followed it properly and we didn't find any difficulty. Unavoidable delay due to technical reasons. This happened a couple of times. The student got, uh, um, you know, they were very much worried because they were not called on time. And uh, we uh, explained this to them again. They could be available. They should be available if called early and they should be prepared to wait in case of unavoidable delay. Once this was explained to them, they were all prepared and uh, they didn't uh, stress much. And of course, we also didn't have much of technical difficulty once the marks were going on very well. This is a very uh, important point here, error in assigning the students to breakout rooms. How did we overcome this? We, after multiple trial and error, we followed this uh, format. We printed the actual hot copy of the uh, sequence of allotment with names and pictures. 
And this was there with the host and co-host and also with the invigilators and with the verification team. So once the student is assigned, this is the first round. And the second round, the first student from panel one should go to panel two. The second student should go to panel three and so on. So this was printed and once the student were assigned, a manual tick was put everywhere. And we also ensured once the students are admitted, the host repeat the sequence and the co-host verifies it again. So we were doing double checking every time. And these three letters, what you see on the left side, B, 2, and E, these are nothing but when do we have to send the display message? Broadcast message was sent three times for every round, B for beginning the exam, and two, uh, for two minutes to end the exam, and E for to end the exam when the time is over. And all these broadcast messages were uh, coordinated with the bellkeeper and the timekeeper and so that you know the examiners could hear the sound as well as see the message because uh, sometimes the examiners missed the display message when they were very uh, busy in conducting the exam. So we ensured that there should be a sound as well as the visual input for the examiners so that there is standardization of the timing. This can happen a few times. Uh, suddenly the student will disappear during the exam, unexpected disappearance, or suddenly there will be failure to log in from the students. So how did we overcome this? We took a policy decision in agreement with HODs, vice deans, and deans, because each department had their own guidelines. So we had multiple options. These are the two options which we used very often. Option one, the students are allowed to I mean, we were allowed to allot another student belonging to the same or different panel based on the waiting list. Some departments allowed us to follow option two, where we left the panel free and put the defaulters at the end because some of the examiners wanted to stick to their panels. So you can have your own decisions based on your infrastructure, but this should be decided beforehand, before conducting the real exams and the suspected behavior or any untoward incidents, you should have the incident report form ready and you have to fill the details, whatever happened and the examiner, co-examiner, the invigilator should sign in this uh, critical incident report and it should be handed over to the assessment unit. These were the four, uh, these were the few challenges we had and I was happy to share with you the uh, feasible solutions. So before we end to summarize, you have to get the support from all stakeholders and ensure robust infrastructure. Select a dynamic team, which will be helping you throughout. And once you select the team, please give focus to training. And the training should be supported with simplified checklists. And every time you have to plan and micro plan for every single session, you should have backup plan for manpower and material as well. We recommend you to keep the photocopy with the faces and names in alignment for different rotations because the host will definitely find it difficult during the exam to assign the students to different breakout rooms. We also recommend combination of electric bell and display messages so that uh, the examiner knows when to start the exam and when to stop the exam. And briefing and debriefing sessions for every exam is very important so that you start the exam with confidence and end with feedback from all the stakeholders. And above all, we need to anticipate challenges and develop strategies beforehand so that when you are prepared for the worst, you will be able to handle any scenarios. I hope this presentation helped you and we are happy to help you in whatever way we can. This would have instilled some amount of confidence in you. It is doable and with some amount of dedication and hard work, definitely it's worth trying. Thank you very much. Over to Sarah. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Archana. And now as uh, Dr. Archana's session is very much related and linked to Prof. Muhammad Hani's session, so we will keep the questions and discussion uh, postponed until the end of Prof. Muhammad's session. Okay, so now I welcome Prof. Muhammad Hani to present his session, uh, which will be on the implementation of online OSCE. Okay. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Dr. Archana. Thank you, Stephen, for the excellent presentations. Uh, so I'm uh, complimenting uh, the work of my colleague, uh, Dr. Archana, and will uh, present uh, how did we implement this. As you can see in the picture, it is a complicated uh, 
and a very complex process where <laughs> we are dealing with uh, multiple uh, uh, stakeholders. We are dealing with students, we are dealing with assessors, we are dealing with IT personnel, and it's, it needs a lot of, uh, it's, a, it's a process that it's depending totally on uh, actually doing everything right. So what Dr. Archana mainly discussing was about, about the planning and the organization and trying to make it error free. Uh, it takes a lot of effort to do this. So today our objectives are to describe some methods of uh, suggested methods for online assessment of clinical competence to demonstrate the process of our AGU online clinical assessment in a stepwise approach to reflect on students and assessors feedback. We collected their feedback and we will share it with you to discuss possible advantages of this method. Just a reminder, assessment should be aligned with teaching. Uh, so you, you might, if you are going to choose a method for your online assessment of clinical competence, it should be aligned with the method of teaching that you have used. Uh, these are actually some uh, suggestions. I shared this with, uh, with our colleagues from uh, uh, India before, and uh, I'm suggesting here that we might triangulate these three methods together. Uh, as you've seen in uh, our, my colleague Stephen's presentation, we can assess some of the uh, objectives related to clinical competence in the written exam. And this will respond to some of your questions about the OSPI. Stations. We didn't use any OSP because the modern uh, software allows you to examine, use pictures, use lab records, use x-rays, uh, to ask students in uh, MCQ uh, single best answer format about really uh, clinical knowledge. So I would really uh, encourage uh, 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 schools who are using uh, electronic uh, assessment uh, of, of written exams to enrich their assessment for the clinical years with clinical questions to replace the uh, usual OSP. And we also might use the formative uh, part to assess clinical competence. Uh, we've seen some uh, really good uh, uh, expertise uh, for, uh, from multiple countries to use virtual scenarios and virtual uh, um, videos uh, to assess clinical reasoning and clinical decision making management and uh, approach to clinical cases and then comes our part which we are covering uh, tonight which is the online OSCE as, uh, clinical assessment. This is a suggested framework about what aspects of the clinical skills that you might uh, uh, cover using each method. As you can see, the written assessment is, uh, might be limited to, uh, to assess data interpretation and management, while the uh, OSC, online OSCE actually can assess all aspects, uh, maybe weak in assessing physical examination skills and professionalism. Uh, physical examination skills can be used in like uh, uh, proxy methods, like uh, using videos that's showing clinical examination done in a wrong manner or clinical findings that students can hear or uh, uh, interpret. And this also can be used in, our, in, in other uh, electronic written exams. You can use videos in the electronic written exams instead of the clinical or in addition to the clinical stem that you are using, uh, to the clinical vignette. Um, and at last, the online VIVA structured oral uh, exams, you can also assess history taking, data interpretation, management and clinical acumen, communication and professionalism for sure. So the, the idea is to triangulate, use more than one method to make uh, the best outcome of using all methods. So by online OSCE here, we mean that we are conducting our usual objective structured clinical exam using either meeting application or learning management system. And as we've discussed, it can cover most of the clinical competence apart from the physical examination skills. Uh, I have conducted a, a webinar with uh, Mahi and uh, Asumina Fry uh, uh, Institute about uh, like five weeks ago. And this, uh, we've conducted a survey to the participants, 65 doctors responded to the survey. 
and this was uh, the outcome of the of the uh, uh, of the survey. They think that uh, online OSCE uh, development of items is somewhat difficult. The effort uh, needed to train assessors is very high. Technology challenges, it's very challenging, but it's, it has an acceptable validity, acceptable uh, reliability, and high educational impact. So, and this is for the video, objective structured video examination, formative assignment, and written assessment. So a mixture of those will be uh, really feasible. And the online OSCE is not at all, uh, despite the, the technical difficulties, is not at all uh, um, um, uh, a method that lacks validity or liability according to the medical educators' perspectives here. So we started with some, uh, with some assumptions. We assumed that uh, we need to develop shorter scenarios. Uh, and the scenarios will be role played either by the assessor himself or by a role player. Uh, when coming to experimenting this, actually we, did, we used uh, scenarios of the same length. Uh, consider, consideration for uh, physical distancing and safety of examiners and role players was uh, a challenge. Uh, innovation to reduce cheating and keep students busy. Uh, so I, I've seen some of your questions in the chat and I can tell you that it's, yes, you need to, uh, to innovate. And as Dr. Mona, uh, Professor Mona was saying, uh, sh we admit cohorts of students into the same exam and try to put each cohort in a room. We will come in, 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 uh, to the details of this in a in few minutes. So we put each cohort in a different room and they will not mix up. And by this, we can use one question for two cohorts of students. Then we will, uh, one set of questions, then we will need to change the set of questions. Um, we had a, a, an assumption also that it cannot be performed at a wide scale as usual OSCE but we might be mistaken after uh, uh, actually experimenting this, we've come to a conclusion that we might test uh, up to 40 students in an OSCE that consists of 10 stations, interactive stations. So if we are using 10 interactive stations, we might test up to 40 students in uh, around 4.5 hours, including the breaks. So you can test uh, a good number of uh, students. For some specialties, uh, they prefer to use Vival. We will come to this. And in some speci other specialties, they use a mix of role playing or OSCEs uh, uh, and Vival. And there's always the idea about adding videos to the station uh, in order to assess some physical examination skills. So as, as uh, I told you before, either videos with wrong steps, wrong technique, or uh, positive findings that you need the student to interpret. So what we are uh, talking here uh, about uh, tonight uh, is our end of rotation clinical exams. We had a group of students, year six students. We didn't know what to do as most of the clinical school, uh, medical schools all over the world, what to do, what are we going to wait, we have no, uh, we had a lot of uncertainty. Are we going to wait? Uh, should we postpone the exams? Should we examine them? How much of the uh, exams uh, or the clinical competence can be assessed using online OSCE? So we the school decided to test the students, to examine the students, and uh, we used three different methods of examination. Structured VIVA exams, it was because uh, I've seen too many questions about this, the structured VIVA exams, we, it was used in the surgery and the rotation exam. We, we used two assessors and they were examining each student for 20 minutes. Uh, the end in this exam, we had managed to examine 40 uh, students per day, around 40 students each day. For the OSCE exam, we had two variations, one with the, where the assessor role play the scenario, and the other uh, uh, variation was that we bring a role player and train the role player and he role play the scenario for the student. So our design uh, for the clinical assessment was mainly, uh, we had some like choices. 
So we agreed that we bring the assessors and role players into campus while the students are at their home. As you, as you know that AGU is a regional uh, university and students are for, we have students from Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Oman and uh, United Arab Emirates, uh, as well as Bahrain. So we agreed that the assessors will be here, the role players will be in campus and students will be at home. Uh, we were choosing between using purchasing laptops uh, and using uh, or using our existing desktops adding webcams and speakers we agreed to purchase only webcams and speakers to uh, to our uh, existing desktops we also agreed that lan is much more has much more stable connection uh, and uh, more reliable compared to wi-fi we we searched uh, the applications the available applications and we agreed to use do zoom because of the uh, excellent breakout room function which is the, the core of this uh, adaptation um, so and we agreed that we will have an exam host a coordinator who will coordinate moving assessors and students into and out from uh, the breakout rooms we agreed that IT support is essential for the success of this exam and uh, we agreed to the mechanism that I've told you about that we can use the same set of questions for two cohorts of students so this is our main design for our uh, clinical assessment. So now I'm going to take you uh, through the most interesting part uh, uh, this evening, which is um, a journey through our online clinical assessment. We will take it stepwise. So prior to the exam, uh, the department, so if this is the, for example, I'm from family medicine. So if this is the family medicine exam, the family medicine department secretary, will start preparing for the exam. She will start preparing the, for the rules. She will start communicating with the assessors, communicating with the students, and sharing the exam instructions with the students, sharing the exam uh, uh, instructions with the assessors, and prepare the sitting here in campus. She has a checklist. We developed this, we, when, we began, when, when we began this, we had no, nothing written, and while we were conducting our mocks and experimenting and experimenting and finding the uh, unexpected uh, problems that arise from uh, this OSCE, like any other OSCE, it has uh, all kinds of unexpected stuff that comes out. Uh, so based on our expertise, we developed a checklist for the department secretary to use prior to the exam. Then we come to the exam day in the morning, we conduct briefing, uh, meeting with the IT personnel. So one of our uh, um, most essential uh, things that we've used is to use IT support, one IT personnel for each room. In the beginning, we had like two supporting eight panels, eight rooms, and it was, uh, it was not successful in our first MOOC. So what we, we needed to use one, one uh, IT support per room or per panel. Uh, so what I do in the morning that I gather, meet with the IT, our IT people, explain to them the nature of the exam, what kind of exam is this, how many minutes are needed, are there, is there, are there any role players, uh, is there any kind of, uh, for, uh, uh, for how long they will share the screens with the students, then I log into uh, Zoom and start the meeting, and they go into the panels along the corridor that Dr. Archana showed you, and they go into the computers and log into the meeting using the name of the panel, which is, uh, it has a label on the door. So if this is panel two, they will uh, join the meeting and name themselves as panel two. So now the meeting is open is established and the IT personnel uh, are joined the meeting. For each exam, meeting means exam. So uh, for each exam, we have this type of uh, uh, organization. We have a pre-exam room, which were developed later into two pre-exam rooms for ID identification. Then for, for example, for this exam, we had five, uh, five stations. Uh, five pa uh, panels A and B. So this this was the family medicine exam. 
we had two stations for this end of rotation exam. And the two stations are replicated for five parallel sets. So we can examine 10 students at a time and admit another 10 students. So we examine 20 students using the same set of questions, which is in this example are two OSCE stations. Then we have the post-exam room where students are moved after they finish. So uh, what, what we do is these are our students. These are our panels. So once the student finishes, uh, for example, it's 10 minutes station. So after 10 minutes, I move the students from 1A to 1B. And I move students from 1B to 1A. And I move a student from 2A to 2B and the student from 2B to 2A. After they finish the two, uh, the two uh, stations for 20 minutes, I moved all students to post exam and other 10 students will be already admitted to the 10 stations. This is how we managed uh, the breakout rooms as actual OSCE stations. Uh, this is another important part uh, wh where I go to the settings and start um, apply the settings and I have a checklist also for the settings necessary for the exam. One of these settings is to prevent students from chatting with each other. One of the settings is to move participants into breakout rooms automatically without needing for their approval. So they find themselves moved from one room to another and disable others like allow participants to come back to the main room. Uh, uh, enable waiting room, which is another important feature. Then our technical team, while I, I, I start this, our technical team, uh, as I told you, initiate, uh, start the computer in this room, which is an exam room. This is our technical uh, support person and this is an examiner. They get into the computer, they uh, log into the meeting using the meeting ID and ensure test the microphone, test the camera, test the speaker, uh, check that they can share the screen and stay there for the whole exam to help the assessor if he, if he face any difficulty. Then after we uh, get every, all the panels uh, on board, we bring the assessors for a very important assessors briefing that we didn't have also in the beginning. Uh, so from the mocks, we learned that we need to bring the assessors. So the, uh, the head of department is sitting here. He explains to the assessors what, what are the expectations from them at the level of the department. And myself and our colleague, Dr. Muhammad or Dr. Archana, we run an actual uh, uh, demonstration of uh, an actual Zoom meeting here in the room using the, this uh, smart screen to make the assessors familiar with, with what will be going on and what, what's expected from them regarding running the, the Zoom meeting and when can they uh, go for uh, help of the, uh, of the IT personnel. Or if they, for example, one of the things uh, and how are they going to, uh, for example, if you have your students and you didn't hear the bell, don't start the exam until you hear the bell like any other normal OSCE. Once you hear the other bell, please stop the exam and wait for the coordinator to move the student out of the room into another room. Uh, so they were receiving this demonstration and uh, one of, uh, and they were explained what are the functions, what are the buttons that they can use and the, uh, the icons that they can use in the Zoom. Uh, one of these icons uh, was recording. So each, we allow each panel to record the exam for quality assurance. It was, a, it was an excellent function. Uh, one of the functions that they can use is asking for help. While they are in the breakout room, which is the, our virtual exam room, if they suspect that the student is talking to someone, uh, any uh, bizarre voices, or the student is not looking uh, into the, uh, the webcam, they can ask, they are suspecting that he's cheating and they can ask for help and we can send a faculty invigilator to investigate uh, the situation, maybe ask the student to move the camera around or ask the student about the bizarre voices in his room. Uh, so now, while uh, I am in the, in the uh, assessor briefing room, my colleague, Dr. Archana, the co-host, was admitting 
the panels. These are our few, uh, excellent, amazing IT personnel. Uh, and we, we, we didn't have this much number of IT personnel, so we used uh, our employees and we trained them to become IT support persons uh, for the sake of using what we have, or the resources that we have. So they, we, we test the sound, we test the video, the quality of the video, the quality of the picture, and we admit them into uh, the proper panels. And we, uh, the department secretary, and this time, she is uploading the exam material into each computer. The, the first set of questions are being uploaded to the computers, to the desktops that we are using. And uh, then the, when, the, when the assessors come out from the briefing, the, she, guides, she guides them to the rooms. And uh, she was one of, the, one of the most essential things is to have a WhatsApp group for the cohorts of the students who are going into the exam. And uh, on time, she sends uh, the ID of the exam to the students in order to come into the waiting room. Now, assessors are briefed, uh, questions are uploaded to the uh, screens, and we are coming to the exam initiation. We are preparing the exam initiation. So the first thing is, again, we check the sound with the assessors and we check the assessor, that the assessors can share screen and can unshare screen. Uh, then after each assessor, uh, can, uh, we check that he can do this, we admit him into the, into the breakout room or the virtual panel. Then we start admitting students into the waiting room. I will, I will display this short video. Here I am assigning, as you can see, I am assigning panel 3B into room 3B. So I'm assigning the panel into the, the right panel into the corresponding room, panel 4A into the corresponding room, panel 4B into the corresponding room. And here are the assessors. I'm checking with this assessor that she can share her screen properly and then admit her to the breakout room and start doing the same exercise with another assessor. Uh, these are also important, uh, th this display, Here's a, here I am, these are the different assessors, it was the family medicine exam, and here you can see the role player, this is a role player, and this is the assessor. This is also a role player, and this is the assessor. Um, this is also a, ro a role player, and this is the assessor. So, this is how it looks, from my side, from my end before I admit them to the rooms. When they go to the rooms, they are on their own. And this is uh, how it looks from, I would like to welcome Dr. Bashir, he's one of, and Dr. Khaldun, they are examiners and they are uh, among the attendees. Uh, this is how it looks. This is the waiting room. We have here 23 students waiting. And these are the participants who are already admitted, who are the examiners. So I'm admitting the examiners, then I admit the students and distribute them into the rooms according to the schedule that we are having. So now I'm checking with this examiner that she can share the screen and that the, the audio is clear, the video is clear. And now she will, will share the question from her screen. So this is the exam question and she's good to go uh, to the waiting, uh, to the uh, room. Now examiners are inside the breakout rooms. We admit students into the pre-exam rooms. We, as Dr. Archina pointed, we have two pre-exam rooms. This is our uh, uh, colleague. Uh, she's, she's having six students and she's, uh, she's doing the IV check and asking them to retain the camera and give them the final exam instructions. This is one, part, then one very important part, which is the color uh, sheet with all the pictures of the students show, so she can know which student she is talking to and uh, uh, checking their ID number and their uh, webcam images. Now we are ready to, to start. Now students are in the, the pre-exam room. Assessors are in the rooms, in the ex virtual exam room. Now Dr. Archana and myself are using the same sheet, which is organized and labeled according to the uh, panels. And we are admitting the students according to this sheet. And then we will shuffle the students according to the system. Uh, that we are using. This is the most uh, uh, important part.
And once the students start the exam, I, uh, uh, I send a broadcast message to the assessors from the breakout room panel, start exam now, and they will hear a bell on the same time. They can start the exam. Two minutes before uh, ending the exam, I send a notification. It's visible to everybody, visible to students and assessors. So two minutes prior to the end. And by the end of the exam, I send another message, end exam now, and they hear the bell. They stop questioning the students or stop asking or stop role playing the students. Here again, we have a student, we have a role player, and we have an examiner sitting in the back and uh, uh, keeping the physical distancing and safety. Uh, they are wearing their masks, they are sitting uh, 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 apart from each other. And here we have also the invisible invigilator, our colleague, uh, who they had a problem with the audio and he came into the room to check that everything is okay. And we, we a lot, in a lot of circumstances, we come and provide IT support uh, if they are having connectivity problem or audio problem. So I'm uh, rotating the students. And while the students are being examined 15 or 30 minutes before they finish, this is the department secretary. This is Dr. Archan, and this is our colleague, Dr. Muhammad. They are the co-hosts. And now I am admitting the second group of students into the pre-exam room for ID check again, while the first cohort of students are being examined. So there is no chance that the students being examined uh, uh, contaminate or share the content of the exam with their colleagues because their colleagues are going through the ID check. Finally, we exchange cohorts. Students who finish the exams, are uh, their exam are moved into the post-exam room with, here's our colleague, Dr. Mona, Vice Dean for Clinical Affairs. She's collecting their feedback in the post-exam room. And while they are, as, as Professor Mona was uh, explaining, I, I think it's Professor Mona Sheikh, uh, while these students are in the post-exam room, others are being admitted into the panels. With, we are using the same set of questions. After using the set of questions for two cohorts, we change the question. After we run this uh, two cohorts of students, the exam secretary, we give 10 to 15 minutes break to the assessors. Exams, uh, the department secretary goes around and change the questions. She deletes the questions on the desktops and uh, upload a new set of questions uh, on the desktops so we can run another two cohorts of students. Ah, uh, this is interesting, the feedback from students. So as you can see, students were strongly agreeing that the exam was, they were clearly informed. The MOOCs prepared them well for the exams. Uh, there, were, uh, there was efficient communication from the school administration and the students. The transition between the rooms was okay. Format of the online exam was acceptable to most of the students. The examiners and invigilators were professional. Exam materials were, uh, were clear. Here we have some uh, objections. And that th this exam can assist clinical skills. We also needed their perspective about this. 102 out of 150 students think that they strongly agree that it can assist clinical skills. And 110 had an, uh, uh, strongly agree that they were satisfied uh, overall regarding the online clinical assessment. With this, this data are for the Viva, the simulated OSCE with the role player and OSCE simulated with the exam. Uh, some of the feedback, what did you like best? Sitting relaxed at home instead of being stressed or <laughs> waiting in Salmanaya Medical Complex corridor. This is very interesting. The organization from the beginning to the end was very, very smooth. And the issues brought up during the mock were resolved. This was a very positive comment. How smooth the process went, excellent choice. Doctors were asking specific questions. They stick to one objective, ease of the exam setting, support of all faculty members. The best thing about it, that it's recorded. They value this and very comfortable. It was very organized and very similar to actual exam. Two minute reminder before end of each station was very helpful. This, this is, of, of course, uh, a sample of their uh, feedback. I also uh, generated this uh, word cloud, as you can see. 
the most repeated words are smooth. Everything is good. Organized, home, uh, stressful, it was less stressful. Uh, doctors, comfortable. So students uh, are having a really positive uh, feedback about this kind of exam. Uh, okay, what did they dislike? Voice issues. Role player, they can hear the role player, but they cannot hear the examiner who is sitting in the back because of the physical distancing. This is an issue. Lack of privacy, they disliked, uh, some of them disliked being asked to remove, uh, uh, rotate the camera around their rooms while their colleagues are sitting there and they have the right to dislike this. Uh, I cannot do physical examination. It is easy and it helps in our marks. So they are missing the physical examination part. Uh, there was a delay. They, they also complained of being hold until their, the first cohort uh, uh, finishes their exam. So they didn't like this. This stressed me out more than clinical hospital exam. The, this was the uh, uh, point of view of some of the students. Extra time take, makes you feel bad after being done with the history. By this, they mean that the, the station was too short and, or, or they finished too early and they, they feel that they have done, not done uh, good enough. The questions were hard. We didn't participate in clinical practice and I guess they expected a bit too much from us. It's also a rational uh, concern. Suggestions for improvement, nothing. Thank you so much, AGU, for all this hard work. I really appreciate what you uh, all doing during this difficult time of Corona crisis. Make them easier and superficial, please. <laughs> Showing the question all the time because uh, assessor used to share questions and then remove, uh, stop sharing the screen after a minute. So students uh, are requiring the questions to be displayed for a longer time. Improving the pictures, it was a common complaint in some of the exams, the quality of the pictures. Simulated scenario like uh, the one taken in simulation center would be far more easier for both students and examiners. Equality in case selection, they, they thought that some cases were uh, more difficult than others. Time not adjusted in a proper way. These are their suggestions for improvement. As for the assessors' feedback, most of the assessors were also uh, very ex uh, it was uh, they accepted the exam very well regarding uh, they were clearly informed mocks prepared them well efficient communication from our side being helpful a briefing they think that the briefing conducted be, uh, before the exam was helpful technical support adequate they like the technical support they didn't like physical distancing that much a lot of objections here exam duration for some was too long exam material was not satisfying that much but for overall, of course, it's, it's to the right side. Uh, exam reflects real practice, moderate uh, agreement, proper sampling from the curriculum, also moderate agreement. Evaluation form structure is uh, efficient. They agreed that the evaluation form used was good. Exam can assess clinical competence. Here we find some moderate agreement also. Overall satisfaction, most of them were satisfied with the outcomes of the exam. Another word, cloud, organization, support, uh, IT support, useful, mocks, uh, real, preparation were the most common words. Recommendations from our assessors, use another venue, more, use more clinical stations, train tutors on computer technology. We, they, they felt that they don't have enough training. Practice the role player prior the day of the exam and assess performance of each role player before the actual exam, more role player training, having similar sessions during the training, more pictures, labs, and lab results and x-ray, physical examination using videos, develop a better place with the geographical sitting, maybe cubicle or specific room. We studied this and we decided to use offices for multiple reasons. Add a short video again, more clinical questions, to evaluate. These were the recommendations from our uh, uh, examiners. Now we are planning for our MD exit exam. We will uh, examine, we will have two meetings. We will examine 10 students per meeting. So in each 
uh, for each set of questions, we will examine 20 students and then we will admit another 20. So for each set of, question, of questions, we will examine 40 students. And this will take like, uh, I was uh, telling you 4.5 hours, then uh, uh, we, we, uh, we use another set of questions in the, uh, in the next, using the same methodology, but now each student will be examined for 10 stations. The maximum number of stations we've examined them so far in the end of rotation exams was four stations in the psychiatry specialty. They were examined for four stations. Each station was 7.5 minutes. So after being through this, and I had um, a lot of experience in uh, uh, traditional OSCE, what about online OSCE? I personally, these are my reflections. It's, it has an, uh, 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 using this method, it can help us uh, to manage student movement in an easier way. Uh, accurate, very accurate time control. The ability to use videos and other high quality media is there. The exam is video recorded, which is a very good thing. It's valid for future practice and the telemedicine. Telemedicine can be part of our, it apparently will be part of our clinical practice and we are examining the students in the same way. This, is, this provides more safety for all parties and it is less stressful for most of the students, not for some of the students. What are the lessons learned? Easier is always better. Always test assumptions. Don't assume that, for example, that assessors can share and stop sharing the screen, for example. Frequent training and updating for all uh, persons who are involved in the exam. Communicate prior, during, and after the exam to improve. Always improve. Efficient use of resources is very important. Be open to learn and to improve from mocking. Support your core team who is conducting the planning, the training, the capacity building, and the execution of the exam. This is a preprint that we've developed. Um, tips to conduct virtual clinical assessment. You can scan this QR code or use uh, this DOI to access our preprint. It will be published soon, inshallah. Thank you very much. And now we are ready for, for your uh, questions. Thank you very much. Sorry. Okay, sorry. Okay, so thank you very much, Professor Hani. Now we will take a few minutes uh, uh, for discussion and questions that were directed for both you and Dr. Archana. Uh, we will start with the first question. Um, okay, uh, we had a participant asking that, uh, did you use real patients or patients or simulated patients for the OSCE? Simulated. Okay. What is the, okay. And um, the next question was, um, uh, what skills were assessed in OSCE? Okay, we are, we've assessed history taking, uh, interpretation okay. of data, uh, management, clean decision making, uh, communication skills. Okay, uh, what was the device used for input? Mm, well, I need more clarification on this. Stephen, can you, can you help me with this? What was the device used for input? I don't know. If, if okay. she can ask again. Please, if you can forward your question one more time. Also, we had a, uh, we had a participant asking that, what if one student face internet problem during the second station? Yeah. Uh, it's, uh, we have, like Dr. Archana described, we have an incident reporting. So if the student, uh, we, we, we thought about the possibilities. So we had like uh, agreement from the college council about the different scenarios that might happen. If the student lost connection early in the exam and can rejoin, he will continue, he will resume the exam. If it's like, okay. if it's in the first one or two minutes of a 10 minutes exam, if he rejoined, he can resume. Okay. Uh, if the student is performed 75% of the exam, 
no need to rejoin. The grade will be, uh, he will be graded for the part that he conducted. Okay. Otherwise, we have other, if the student has like lost connection, we might have an, uh, report the incident and take uh, a proper action with, uh, uh, that it's, uh, for example, for one of the students, we kept her for a different cohort of students. So we added her and we, we re-examined her from the start because she lost connection completely. So we will take the action according to the situation. Okay. Okay, we have here also Ms. Hiba asking if we can share the kinds of questions that we asked in the online OSCE. Okay, uh, there is no need. We have, we've actually used the same type of questions used in, uh, in the usual OSCE. Nothing was, was okay. uh, changed. Okay, so we had a similar question in which they were also asking about how did you assess motor skills? We couldn't. For this time, we, we didn't assess physical examination skills or motor skills yet. Okay, I think that's it for now. And thank you very much, Professor Mohammed and Dr. Archana, for your valued input. You're most welcome. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Sarah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, now, um, last but not least, we will have uh, Professor Abdul Halim Jafalla, Dean of CMMS and the Director of WHO Collaborating Center for Health Professionals Educational De Development for the closing remarks. Dr. Abdul Halim, can I'm coming. Thank you, Sarah. <laughs> nice Good evening, uh, everyone. I hope you got benefit from our shared experience on online exams. I would like to thank you all, thank all participants from the Gulf countries, uh, from the Emro region, and uh, from other parts of the world also. We got uh, participants from India, from everywhere, actually. We, so far, we have 250 participants in this, shared in this webinar. Uh, special thanks goes to the deans of the GCC Medical Schools, of Dr. Mona Saadun, Dr. Ahmed Lamro, and others. Uh, special thanks also to Dr. Uh, Golin from the WHO office at Cairo. And uh, would like to thank the Ain Shams University and Shams Medical School, the famer Dr. Samira, uh, Samira Ahmed, and the technical staff there who supported us. And uh, on behalf of our uh, president, uh, Dr. Khaled al Ohali, the president of the Arabian Gulf University, I would like to thank you all. And uh, just to mention, we'll, uh, Sarah will post the uh, next uh, webinar. It will be on uh, same day like this on 6th of July, webinar on online uh, teaching. And uh, hopefully you can join us. And uh, good night and good evening for you all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Abdul Halim. So finally, we would like to thank you all for participating. And as we mentioned earlier, all of your remaining questions will be taken into con consideration and we will answer them shortly. But uh, as Professor Abdul Halim just mentioned, before we leave this meeting, we would like to announce that we are having uh, we are going to implement another webinar here in, at our center, uh, which will be on overcoming online teaching challenges this time, also during COVID-19 pandemic, in which also a number of uh, our distinguished faculty will be, uh, will reflect, uh, again, uh, Arabian Gulf University's experience in that regard. Uh, we will share with you, of course, all the, ex uh, all the details via email and for any other inquiries, please feel free to contact me anytime. Thanks and looking forward to have you with us in our up, uh, upcoming webinar. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sarah. Thank you. Most welcome.